Greetings, programs. Your buddy Hank Fernail here, back with another awesome episode of Drunkards and Dragons. We talk about how to play D&D just a little tiny bit more better than you used to, like a big old grown-ass woman or man. Horror in RPGs. Now, D&D ha has a, a wonderful spot in the pantheon of creative fiction in that it already has a sort of penchant for the demonic, the dark, rattling chains, deep dungeons, and dark shadows, and so there's already a horror component built into everything that we love about role-playing, but all too often, how to actually execute the things that make horror work as a genre can be really hard to pin down. So as a lifer in horror, as really as someone who is even into horror before it was appropriate in any way, like way too young in the in the late 70s, early 80s, getting into it against my parents' wishes. <laughs> and it probably, you know, there's probably a lot of psychological damage. But as that kind of person, a lifelong horror enthusiast, I'm going to take a stab at what it's all about. So get comfy, let's kick that intro, and we're going to talk about executing horror in your RPG. The more notes you make, the smarter you must be, right? Not a lot of notes here. If we're going to talk about how to bust out horror at your table as the GM, or even as a player, you know, players can bring a lot to the table too when it comes to building dread and building tension and apprehension at the table during a horror session. But if we're really going to talk about that in detail first, we got to do some other work. We got to do some brain work. Talk about the deconstruction of what makes good horror work. Not just any horror, but the good stuff. This video is not here to talk about the history or evolution or the best of horror at all. But what I want to talk about is deconstructing, taking apart exactly what makes the best horror experiences, be they stories, uh, comics, movies especially, that's like where horror really shines. Also, audio stories in recent years have become, for horror enthusiasts, have become a big sort of part of the genre. We want to deconstruct what makes it tick. First of all, when we're deconstructing horror, confinement. The very first thing that has to happen for really good horror to work is that the heroes must be confined. They must be isolated. You need a practical way to keep them from comfort or from escape. This is a lot like in my trap theory videos. The first step is to contain them because any person in their right mind, after the things we're about to talk about start happening, would get the hell out of there. Toot sweet. Know what I'm saying? One of my favorite moments for this um, is in the newer film called The Apostle where they, they sort of take this ship ride to this isolated island. Now that is not a new theme to put into a horror film, but it's the way that they do it, that it feels like there's no going back. It's not going to be easy to get off of this island. But the, the fear of that is not a big deal, right? This is something we all know about good horror. At first you're just like, oh, this is a somewhat inconvenient commute. <laughs> but what you're actually doing as the storyteller is cutting it off. You are isolating this series of variables from the outside world. So that's part one, confinement and isolation. You got to get it done first before you're going to do all the cool stuff that we're about to get into. Second, and this is often where we start to get a sense that, ooh, we're in for a good one. Okay, now one thing about horror is that when you're watching a scary movie, you go into it knowing that. And that piece of meta is a huge part of the genre. I don't think a lot of other genres really use meta in this way. The audience is expecting something scary. And that expectation has to be played with. You can't ignore it. You have to assume, as the creator of good horror, that the, the audience is expecting terrible things. 
And so in your delay of terrible things, you find some magic, okay? And so we come to our second key pillar of deconstructing horror, which is the uh, all is not well moment, or all is not what it seems is, is often how it's done as well. So once the isolation has been established, the heroes of the story are cavorting about, they're meeting people or they're experiencing landscapes. And there has to be a first moment where one realizes, uh-oh, we didn't bring enough granola bars. If you're going to slowly build this apprehension and this feeling that something is wrong, that's a fine starting point. Like, where are the granola bars, dude? I told you to bring the granola bars. I thought you had them. We, we left them on the ferry. The ferry is not gonna come back for six more days, man. What are we gonna eat, dude? Okay, this is not supernatural. This is not a monster. This is not a serial killer. This is not anything scary. It's just granola bars but everything on this trip is not going swimmingly. Now to take this a bit further, there are obviously much higher levels that you can go to, especially with the things are not what they seem. Things are not what they seem can work very well, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, at the tabletop, because players are very much used to what they're being told is real. And so if what it is being told to them or presented to them is not real, and this is sort of like seeing the cat twice in the Matrix, right? There is a moment where you see the same black cat walk by the door twice, and you're kind of like, oh, that was weird. No, that was not weird. All is not what it seems. Something else is, uh, it's probably nothing. <laughs> it's also referred to as the first bad sign or the bad omen. Um, this is often in movies where the audience will be yelling at the heroes to just get out now. But they turn around and like in the great classic Dagon, the sailing uh, vessel which they have brought to this remote village sort of on accident has not only nudged up against the rocks and is grounded but is now damaged and is now sinking. Their inflatable raft is also deflated. They are now confined, but they look at this village like there's no one in this village. That moment when no one's around, that's that first bad sign. Not when the, the uh, sailboat crashes into the rocks. That was more just like, oh, this is going to be a bad weekend. No, when they arrive at that village and they're like, man, we need to get some help and there's no one around, that's that moment. It's the bad omen or the bad sign. It's probably fine. It's probably nothing. Everything's going to be okay. The next key step in the deconstruction of really cool horror is what I like to call the discovery. The discovery is basically something that is not just bad, like missing granola bars, but something has gone horribly wrong here. Very often, uh, this step in horror is um, what uh, I believe Edgar Allan Poe called the magnificent corpse. A magnificent corpse is basically a, a body that fascinates the audience. And this is a, an entire genre of mystery novels and storytelling, which is that a corpse is discovered, or like the TV show Bones. They would discover a corpse. It was a weird corpse. Like, the skull is melted on this thing. Uh, that can't be good. Well, what, what happened? A lot of human instinct sees a dead body and has an instant reaction of like, what happened? I need to know the facts of this. And a, a great method and genre of storytelling is slowly piecing together for you what happened to this terrible corpse. Now, you're going to see later when we get into like what makes horror really work at the table that the Bones method from the TV show of a super gruesome, like, melted, ripped-apart body is not really going to work that well for you at the tabletop, but we're going to talk about that later. For now, this is just a key step in the deconstruction of horror. You discover a scene or evidence of activity that is far darker than anything you had imagined. And if you're good at this, it will not reveal almost anything. Like the hikers stumbling upon, like, an arm bone, right? It doesn't have to be this scene of terror. It's just a discovery that, uh-oh, we're not just missing our granola bars. Like, there's a skeleton right here. Next is basically a, the oppression stage in the amazing Conjuring movie universe, which is where Ed and Lorraine Warren, who were real life sort of a paranormal investigators and helped a lot of people with paranormal situations, describe the process by which demonic forces take over our lives. And uh, the, the, the second stage is called oppression. And, and oppression is when they are moving in on you. They, they are whispering, they're slamming doors, they are like pushing you in the shower and you're kind of feeling that. There's voices, 
They, they, are, they are building in intensity because they have a hold on you. Whatever these forces may be in the story that either you're creating or that you're watching, when we're deconstructing how horror works, this force, this bad, is slowly escalating because it has a hold. Now, quite often the hold comes in the form of someone in a weakened state. Someone is vulnerable to this, either because of psychedelic drugs or alcoholism or fatigue or depression or even just a growing fear or isolation or loneliness or stress from family difficulties or from a broken relationship. But something in, in their makeup gives them a weakness which give this dark force a foothold and slowly it escalates its oppressive actions poking, clawing, pulling the covers off of you at night, creeping out from behind the corner, slamming doors, making creepy noises at night, changing the channel, <laughs> all these little things. Now, these are all sort of ghost story examples that I'm giving, but they can take all kinds of different forms. Um, it works even in a movie like The Thing, where the sort of otherworldly entity, which is a shapeshifter, slowly becomes more and more aggressive because it's more and more desperate to take over the members of the Arctic Research Station. It starts somewhat small and quiet, but then after it tears the dogs apart, it becomes more aggressive, it becomes more risky in its behavior, and it's going further and further. This is all what I like to call the boil, or the progression of the escalation, but I love calling it a boil. I have a podcast about boiling a frog, which is how you very slowly sort of lift the escalation of dark forces in your storytelling. And this brings us right next to our, uh, we're right to our next piece in horror deconstruction, which is the piece that probably pops in a lot of our heads when we think about our favorite horror stories, which is the climax. It's when the violence or the impact or the intensity of the dark force reaches such a crescendo that it can be hard to watch, that you want to almost look away. That climax is the sort of the culmination of everything that has come before. So uh, a great example of this climax is in The Ring, which is where they finally find where Samara is sort of interred in this well, right? And as they're investigating it, this, that, and the other thing happens. The board gives way, the TV hit, psh, slides down, and knocks her into the well. That is a moment of total intensity and the climax of the fear and the apprehension of the film is like white hot at that moment but the villain is nowhere on the screen you just have a moment of going ah, i can't get any worse than this now everybody knows the funny thing about the ring is that that climax where you think it got really crazy and then oh man my heart was pounding is actually not the climax there is that next moment where samara comes to the video shop and she reveals herself in her full form. I would argue, though, that that moment is less scary and is less so the climax than when the TV knocks her into the well. When Samara comes out of the television, I actually think it's a more satisfying moment because you get a full look at what Samara is, but to see her come out of the television is is a bit kitschy. It's a, like a lot of climaxes in a lot of horror movies. This is where they fall off the rails. They just don't have either the special effects or the tastefulness in their camera work to not over-reveal their hand. We all know that what we imagine is more scary than what we see. And so quite often in the climax, they show us a little too much and suddenly it's not scary anymore. Um, the only, one of the few movies I know who didn't do this is Pumpkinhead. Pumpkinhead, we see Pumpkinhead quite early in the, in the film. And he's in a lot of scenes and is sort of highly visible. He's like brightly lit. We see his whole body and stuff, but Pumpkinhead doesn't really get scary until later in the movie where just maybe they just wear you down with how much Pumpkinhead there is. <laughs> Either way, this is our next step, the climax. I know that I do not consider a horror story awesome unless it has this next piece. It's got to have it. And this is the tragic reveal is what I call it, or tragic history or unresolved tragedy. Now... It's difficult to directly confront some of the sort of aspects of tragedy for all of us. Tragedy is not something we want to be thinking about. 
uh, even mentioning things like losing family members or, or, or horrible unresolved events or unexpected death or, or, or suffering on a galactic scale by someone that you care about. Stuff. This is not pleasant stuff to talk about. But to me, in any great horror film, after the climax, you have to have this reveal of what the truth really is. And it is not what you thought. Um, great examples are, are everywhere. Um, one of them could be uh, Silent Hill is a fantastic one. And you're going to see a pattern here. Um, also, there's the Lady in Black. The pattern that you're going to see is that the tragic reveal, where we learn about the history that created all this bad situation in the first place, the tragic reveal shows us that who we thought the villain all along was is not the villain at all. It's those who refuse to see or have disturbed this ancient tragedy. Pumpkinhead, even. If we go back to Pumpkinhead, who's just like a, a giant, huge-headed demon that tears people apart, he's actually not the villain. And we get that when we find out what Pumpkinhead really is and what his history is. He is a thing conjured up for revenge. And once you set him in motion, you can't stop and it consumes you. And really, the villain in Pumpkinhead is the father's grief. That's the villain. The father really is the villain. And when we get that tragic reveal of this truth, it hurts us and it saddens us, but it also sort of frees us of a lot of the fear. The fear of this monster now becomes empathy. And this to me is the sign of great horror and also why horror is such a strangely unique genre, partially because it always is like blending with humor, which is amazing. It's a wonderful part of the genre. But also how in a lot of horror, the villain becomes the hero or, or the villain is someone you can really relate to. Maybe not a hero per se, but someone you can understand like the girl in Silent Hill. She has become this massive font of evil. But in fact, she was an innocent girl who was put up as a, a sacrifice to demonic forces and the sacrifice was botched. And she remains in this state of eternal suffering and from that suffering comes evil. So this is beautiful. This takes what was just a roller coaster ride with things jumping out on either side and then says to you, no, it's so much more. It's got nuance, it's got depth, it's got heartstrings to it. And without this, I don't think you have a brilliant horror movie. And there's a lot of different ways it can be done. Don't get me wrong that I only like a certain sort of type or a certain sort of ghost story or supernatural style of horror. I love them all. But you need this element. And in some cases, they're going to mix up these deconstructed components. A good example is in Halloween. They show you the reveal first. It's the first thing they show you, which is Michael as a boy and sort of the first time he kills. And you understand this person. You see it through his eyes. Remember, he's inside the mask on Halloween. And then we kind of go and we kind of almost forget about it in a way. And I would say that the sort of the, the way they bind all that together is when Donald Pleasance's character arrives in Halloween and he stitches it together. He says, I've been chasing this kid. This kid started as a killer. He's going to be a killer forever. I'm never going to stop until, you know, he's finished. Either way, I think that the tragic reveal, revealing the tragedy or the wrongdoing that gave rise to the darkness is an essential component of any horror story that's going to feel satisfying, that's going to feel rich. I have the final piece in deconstructing horror, which is sort of the epilogue or the apotheosis. <laughs> apotheosis is a cool word, which sort of means um, the process of becoming your god self or your ultimate self. Uh, the epilogue is just obviously, it's a statement after the story seems concluded. Now, in recent years, uh, storytellers have been using the epilogue in a much more funny way. And I really think that this started with Nightmare, Before, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. In Nightmare on Elm Street, we had one of the most memorable epilogues in all of horror, which was everything's fine and it's all over. And then, you know, Freddy pulls his arm through the door and rips the mother's body through the tiny little window. Like, it's like this crazy mannequin that gets like crushed up into there. And there is a moment of horror. And then the convertible slams shut and drives off with the kids, which becomes a sort of a trope in the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. Um, but that moment has definitely become uh, an inspiring moment for a lot of horror storytellers. 
but it takes many, many forms. You could also go back to Friday the 13th, that final moment of supreme evolution is where Jason is not just a sort of a phantom conjured up by his psychotic mother. He is an actual animate mutation from beneath the lake. It's not just a rumor. A lot of people maybe haven't seen the first Friday the 13th movie, but Jason is not the villain in that movie until that final moment of apotheosis. This piece in horror can be difficult to do. A lot of times you can, you know, accidentally do the Stephen King version of horror, which is that things generally end with a giant explosion. Another great version of the apotheosis moment in horror is from the movie, the amazing horror film Rubber, which is the story of, a, of an evil tire. And at the end, the tire sort of jumps, its evil spirit leaps from a tire into a tricycle and this tricycle then starts rolling down a desert road into Hollywood, and behind it, it gathers this new army of evil tires that are all rolling down the highway together. This is a great example of apotheosis and of epilogue, because it, Rubber in general is a sort of a silly movie, but it's a perfect encapsulation of the deconstruction of the moment, is that the evil is vanquished, it's all over, the tragedy has been healed, the wound is healed, but then a moment passes, quiet sort of settles over the town, and then the evil now takes its ultimate form because it's been forgotten. People think it's resolved, just like in The Ring. You helped her, why did you do that, right? And then we suddenly realize Samara isn't a victim, which we thought because of the tragic reveal. She is inherently evil. And now, boom, here it comes with The Ring, she is not stopped in any way. She is thriving by the end of the film. And that is, to me, her sort of final form. Uh, Samara wins in the ring. She perpetuates her death curse. And I think that happens in a lot of good epilogues. You definitely don't want to leave deconstructed horror happy. Just being like, it's all, it's all, it's, everything's fine, guys. That doesn't really leave you with that, that tasty gut fear that you want out of really quality horror. And so you need to use that apotheosis, that epilogue, to drive that final nail into the coffin, so to speak. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> okay, now that we've done all the work to deconstruct what really makes traditional horror storytelling work in movies and books and things like that, now let's get to the actual guts of this damn video, which is how to execute horror brilliantly at the RPG tabletop. So a lot of you guys, uh, Halloween, Samhain, Hallow's Eve is coming up in a couple of days, and the Venn diagram between people who play D&D and people who love Halloween has a very large group in the middle. So a lot of people love playing D&D on Halloween and doing a sort of Halloween-themed game, right? But my opening statement when it comes to executing D&D really well in the horror milieu, you might say, is that... You know how the audience that I mentioned shows up to a horror film expecting terrible things, this meta component to horror, right? Well, never is that worse than on Halloween. They're, they're coming in expecting pumpkins and knives and this is Halloween, you know. They're in the worst possible state for you to really get them. So my advice when it comes to executing quality, scary stories at the table is to, to do your fun, like more holiday-themed Halloween stuff on the holiday. Wait a few months, wait into December. We all know too that like some of the scariest films are always like have Christmas themes, right? <laughs> like Gremlins. So Halloween can be a very challenging time to get that suspension of disbelief from your players. So I would just be like, I would just avoid that altogether from my really scary story that I wanna do. Okay, that's my first piece. So let's talk about what's gonna make horror execute really well at your table. And the way that I want to talk about it is a what you thought was going to work versus a what actually works. A counterpoint way of talking about how you can run kick-ass horror at your table is going to start with sort of the things they meet. What you think is going to work and is going to be cool because scary is scary monsters, right? I see this all the time in RPGs is a GM introduces a scary freaking monster. You know, there's a freaking rotted corpse rising up out of a black pool of muck and it's being animated because it's completely filled with maggots and its lips are stitched shut and one of the eyes is a freaking tennis ball. And oh my God, you guys, isn't that frightening? No, you think scary monsters are gonna work, but what you actually want is happy children. <laughs> you think that presenting this terror is what's gonna be scary. No. 
What's scary is just like, there are just children in this scene, no matter what era or setting like, that you're doing, whether it's fantasy, sci-fi, whatever, and there's just, there's just a happy, content little children standing nearby in a glade of trees. And as you enter the town and this mist sort of slides into the town, you look and you notice there, there are three or four children, well-dressed, just with, with wide smiles on their faces, just enjoying the afternoon, and just taking in the scenery. That works so much better. The second one, what you think is going to work to be scary is growls and grunts, right? Like, <gasps> what are those terrible sounds? It's got to be a gigantic beast. You're expecting there to be growls and grunts. And so you're like, oh, that must be the monster we're going to fight, right? <laughs> That's what goes through a player's mind. Instead of growls and grunts, try old-timey music. You guys hear that? Isn't that the, uh, isn't that the song from the tavern uh, down by the, down by the water? It's probably nothing. It works much better. There's a lot of films that do this, a lot of films, especially in the recent five years or so. The idea of this sort of teeny record player being associated with a moment of pure evil is, is quite common. And I think it works much better to play on the meta that your players are going through rather than going, ooh, there's the growling. Can I roll an intelligence roll and find out where the growling is so we can go stab that thing? <laughs> you can't stab old timey music, boy. <laughs> what you think is gonna work is doomed innocence. Now this is something that you always see GMs do as a way to demonstrate the gravity of a monster or of a deadly threat, is that you have some, some sailors who are coming up on this rowboat and they're like, oh, hello there, it's a fine evening here in the, and then like tentacles shoot out of the water, wrap around one guy's neck, and snap his neck and his jaw is dislocated, one eyeball pops out, he flies out of the rowboat and he goes f feet up down into the water, okay? Doomed innocence. Again, this makes a player think, oh, there's a thing we can fight. Let's go down there. We're way tougher than that dumb villager was anyway, so let's, let's go get it done. Instead of that, try content villagers. Content villagers are just standing by the sea, looking out at the waves. They're just... the waves. It's so beautiful, the way the sea rolls in over the rocks. Isn't it lovely? And you know, there's these dark clouds and like the ocean is black that day. But the villagers are perfectly content. They're perfectly happy. They're just like those happy children standing over in the trees. You are not revealing your hand as the GM. You're messing with them. You're messing with them, man. And it's, if you're like me, your acting is absolutely terrible. Your voice acting is not very good, and your descriptions are never as cool when you're at the table as you thought they were gonna be when you're preparing for the game the week before, right? If you're like me, you got those things going on. But what you can do is this acting that I'm doing right here. Isn't the ocean beautiful today? Isn't it lovely? There's your NPC. Rather than trying to use your thespian skills, your theatrical skills, to induce fear into the player, you are using their own mind. You are, let them, you are letting them imagine what is wrong. You are showing them the horror of not revealing anything. And clearly, the children in the glade of trees and the content villagers are under some kind of evil influence. I mean, let's face it, nobody smiles and looks like that. It's freaking creepy. An extension of this, and our next counterpoint, is that your urge in horror is going to be scribe, to describe terrible things. There are piles of gore. There are intestines that have been pulled out and strung out into the town square. There is a guitar made with human hand tendons sitting in the corner of the tavern. That's going to be your instinct to try to slowly build dread. But what I would suggest is try the opposite, which is to see beauty in gore and evil not to describe it as terrible. See it as beautiful in your own head as the GM and describe it that way. Now, what's an example? Instead of discovering the dismembered corpse of a pigeon lying on a desk in the school and its blood is darkening as it dries in a vision and phantasmagoric terror, C come on, that's like some Vincent Price type stuff. We're, we're, we're kind of past that era. What you're gonna to try to do is see beauty in it. 
So what you're going to say is, as you look at the desk in the school, there is a meticulous, perfectly symmetrical, anatomical dissection of a pigeon. And with great care, the tendons and veins have been spread into a flower-like pattern. Its symmetry and its discipline are flawless. That is much more effective to bring them into what the hell is wrong here rather than, oh, somebody hit a pigeon with a hammer. Now, you're going to see me. I'm like sort of repeating but drilling further into these counterpoints. You're going to want to scare them with screaming. <coughs> I mean, it's fun, but it's not going to build apprehension. Just like before, instead of screaming, you want to do smiling. Happy Low, off-key music, for example, or happy sounds are much more effective to build dread because I thought we were going to have a scary game. I thought there was something horrible here. And this is just like content villagers, happy children playing in the trees, and now I'm hearing like harp music as we tour this old school. That's just it. That's where you're going to build this up so that when you start coming to these key moments, you have them off guard and you have also a nuance that can be appreciated. You're going to want to use screaming, but instead you're going to use smiling. Now here's the final one. And you guys knew I was going to say this. What you're going to want to do is jump out at them. There's going to come a time in your horror game where you have got to jump out at your players. They, they need a combat encounter that isn't just the deranged old mayor of the town who wants to keep them out of the church, right? And his thugs. They're going to want to fight Dagon. They're going to want to fight Pumpkinhead. Here is my most difficult call to you guys to execute horror really well at your table. Don't do it. Do not have Pumpkinhead jump out. Pumpkinhead never jumps out in the RPG version of Pumpkinhead. He is talked about. There are glimpses of him seen here and there. And even during the climax where he's basically trying to tear the players apart, he does not come out and have hit points and bonus attacks and reactions and attacks of opportunity. No, that it so reduces your supreme evil to, to just another meat bag of hit points. Don't do it. In the final confrontation, in the broke down, the ruined old church, where this sort of the deranged villagers have been unable to stop the heroes from attempting to put this old skeleton to rest, to make the demon stop, even when the demon comes forth to stop the heroes, a lightning storm begins, the clouds become so low, a fire breaks out. All they see is glimpses of hands and of horns and of teeth. They never get to even look at the damn thing, but they are taking wounds. They're like walking into this story, I would say, with three failed death saves as a start to the session. And so when they're in this ruined church, these flashes and these glimpses, that's all they ever get. And for this reason, I would also advise do not use miniatures and terrain in any form for the ultimate horror RPG game. You need to have... Handouts are fine. Maybe showing some images are fine. Sound and music are essential. But if you have a miniature of Pumpkinhead and you put it on there and you're moving it around really quick because he has teleport, oh my God, the fun's over. This is ridiculous. He's just like a hand puppet at that point. So if you really do want this feeling of lasting gloom and dread, you can't accidentally show a little version of your supreme evil. You've got to hold your ground. And one really good example of this is The Shining. Now, The Shining would be a very complex and somewhat disappointing and difficult RPG session, but The Shining is brilliant in that it just never really shows you anything. You don't get to see... You get to see that old hag, but she's just a victim of the evil, right? You get to see the, the axe killer twins... Well, they're not the axe killers. They were victims. There we go. You're just seeing the victims. You never see the evil. Another way to do this that's pretty classic is to have players do evil acts because it's in them. This is, can be scary to players. But it all comes back to the same thing. Rather than the urge to jump out, you never jump out. Never. Even as the climax is resolved, they never even really get a glimpse of what it was. 
And you can use NPCs to reinforce this. We've never really even seen it. We don't really know what it is. And this is, I think, essential to creating the afterglow of a really good horror RPG session. None of these rules are so hard and so certain that, you know, when your instinct says you need some blood to splash, splash it. That's about all I got, guys. That is really the counterpoint and the deconstruction of horror that I wanted to present to you. And I also invite you to check out a lot of the great horror content that comes out for RPGs that is not just holiday-based. Um, I don't really want to do a bunch of plugging in my videos, but get out there and do your research. It's not what you think it may be. There's a lot of gems hidden out there that are horror stories that don't play it like... Um, well, one of my all-time favorites, Rise of the Rune Lords, right? The beginning of that campaign is all about this serial murder and, you know, these kind of terrible killings. And I would not call it horror. It's an enemy that the players know they can go find and confront and kill. And so even though that part of that campaign is really cool, I would not call that a, a, a moment of horror adventuring because there just isn't a disturbing enough core, a tragic revelation or an immaterial or unconquerable evil that actually builds its dread even after the climax, rather than being defeated like a normal RPG villain. So give this stuff a try in your game, yo. Play a little bit more better. My name's Hank Renfernail. I'm up here in the laboratory just like painting minis and stuff and like making scary sounds on my synthesizer. So I'm just kind of like, ee -oo -ee -oo -ee. thanks for tuning in. Thanks everybody for hanging out on Patreon. If you guys want to see my uh, Halloween contribution, my scary story, it comes with a like a three page adventure as well and an audio story. It's on Patreon right now. You can sign up for a buck and you get like 70 hours of podcasts, which is kind of crazy to think about. And a bunch of other cool goodies. So jump over there and throw a ducket in the bucket. And I will see you guys on that old internet. I'm going to go back where I belong. So. Bye.